Hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Population Level Risk for Preterm Birth in the U.S. and Alabama. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on our screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, CEU credit may only be awarded for one year for nurses and will expire on June the 30th, 2018, and two years for social workers expiring on June the 30th, 2019. I'm Amy Stratton, State Perinatal Program Director at the Alabama Department of Public Health, and I would like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Janet Bronstein, who is a professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Welcome, Dr. Bronstein, and thank you for coming today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm really glad to be here talking about this um, topic, and I hope you'll find um, this analysis interesting and possibly raise more questions even than it answers, but I think that's good for CEUs. Um, as Amy said, I'm a professor at UAB in the School of Public Health. I'm a social scientist, not an epidemiologist or a clinician. Uh, and I've just always been interested in this topic of preterm birth. It has so many aspects to it. It has a whole clinical aspect, population-based epidemiology, public health, um, a cultural aspect, what does it mean to people, a uh, political aspect, health care, and ethics are all combined, which, which uh, I find quite interesting. I recently published a book on preterm birth in the U.S., one of the things I did in that book was really try to compare uh, what drives preterm birth rates, what makes them high, and what characterizes the United States preterm birth rate compared to other countries. Because as you'll see, we have a higher preterm birth rate than most other developed countries, all other developed countries, um, such as Europe and Canada. For this presentation, I wanted to tell you about that, but then I really wanted to get into a, a kind of an auxiliary question, which is, if you compared Alabama to the rest of the United States, would you find similar risk factors as you find comparing the U.S. to Europe? So that's what I'm going to present today, um, and you'll see what happens, what I found. My guess is that all of us have seen maps that look something like this. And they may be mapping different things. Uh, this is taken from something called the State Premature Birth Report Card that the March of Dimes publishes. They publish it every year in November. Um, this is the one from last November, the most recent one. What they do is they rank states. They actually give us grades, A through F, based on the portion of births that are born before term or before 37 weeks gestation uh, out of all of the births in the state. Uh, and you'll see if you look at this report card, and it's been pretty consistent for many years, our state, Alabama, has an F. Um, we joined Mississippi and Louisiana in the, in the F category, and you can see why, because our premature birth rate, uh, I think this actually used 2015 data, was 11.7 percent. The U.S. is 9.6. Now, you may not know that if you do a similar comparison between the United States and other developed countries, this is mostly countries in Europe here, um, you'll see a similar thing. The United States is the bottom bar there, so it's a much higher premature birth rate than uh, these comparison uh, countries. I think on this chart, uh, we're 9.6, uh, and the next highest one is Hungary. Uh, the best is Finland in terms of rates. So, you know, the U.S. versus Europe looks similar to when you're comparing Alabama to the rest of the United States. So going back to the March of Dimes report card, you know, when you call something a report card, it, it gives a message. And the message that you get from calling that a report card is you should be able to do better than this, right, just like in school. If you tried harder, 
you would have a rate more like the rest of the country or maybe the better ones. And the states that get A's are probably trying harder than uh, the states that get F's. Um, so, and if you look at kind of the news coverage about this report cards, you can see that reflected. Very often the news coverage implies that, uh, you know, the states have a lot of challenges, like this one from CBS News. They usually pick up health insurance, access to care must be important, and then uh, what did the individual uh, choose to do, what behaviors uh, make a difference. That was uh, CBS, this was U.S. News and World Report, also commenting on the 2016 report card. Um, what states should do, assure that services are available, and what women should do, women should plan their pregnancies and keep space between uh, their babies. So, so, you know, the report card reporting always comes out with, there must be something we can do to make this better. If you go to um, the international comparisons, you see a similar thing. What's the United States doing that it should do better in order to uh, improve its birth rate? You almost always see, uh, here's an example of, this was from a 2009 report that came out. Uh, immediately, actually, this was the medical director of the March of Dimes says, uh, the fact that the U.S. rate is so much higher than Europe is an indictment of the U.S. health care system. Uh, and, and something should be done about that. Uh, then adding in, you know, what are, uh, that you have uh, poor and minority women is picked out, what, what are the issues, you know, what are the choices, what social support, et cetera, is needed. Always with the sense that something, you know, if you tried harder, you would have uh, a lower rate. But, you know, if you really look, uh, oh, here's more of that. Uh, more of the, the comments from March of Dimes. So if you actually look at, let's take access to care, here's a map also from March of Dimes data looking at um, which states do more women start prenatal care in the first trimester. Uh, purple is the best. States with more than 85% of pregnant women in 2014 starting first trimester care starting care in the first trimester, and then red is the worst. And guess what? The F states are not the worst in terms of access to prenatal care. Um, in fact, the worst are Texas and Arkansas. And some of those A states, like Washington and Oregon, uh, don't do all that great on access to care. So naturally, I wanted to look at the U.S. versus Europe and, and a similar pattern. The U.S. does have... Uh, Fewer people starting prenatal care in the first trimester. It's, it's an average of about 74% in the U.S. But the next, uh, the next worst preterm birth rate is Germany, similar, you know, just a little bit lower than the U.S., and they actually have about the best prenatal care start rate. Whereas uh, England, which has a, a similar prenatal care start rate to us, have much better preterm birth rates. So it really calls into question this whole uh, rationale is, is it access to care that is really making a difference? And that forces us to ask, what does early prenatal care do? Generally, early prenatal care does not prevent women from having preterm births. Um, it does enable early screening, which then can be managed. People get better care. It helps women establish linkages with their care providers, gives an opportunity for education and support for women, helps to assure that um, high-risk women deliver in appropriate settings. But generally, there's very little that can be done in the prenatal care period to prevent a woman from having a preterm birth. So if not prenatal care, what does uh, affect preterm birth rates? Individually, there are many physiological pathways to delivering early. It's actually a misnomer to think of preterm birth as though it were a single entity. It's just a one way that pregnancies end, and there are all kinds of reasons for that. About two-thirds of the time, the uh, preterm birth occurs because a woman went, went into labor spontaneously before term, and that happens for a lot of reasons. These days, about a third of the time, uh, a woman is often with high blood pressure or some other medical crisis or some concern about the fetus, and the birth occurs prematurely because physicians decide they need to intervene 
and do a cesarean section. So at the individual level, there's multiple reasons. At the population level, which is what we're looking at when we look at those report cards, um, you can break a population into lots of subgroups and, and measure how, what percentage of births are preterm for that subgroup, and you can come up with a list of kind of population level factors that seem to increase the likelihood of a preterm birth. And um, often these are kind of listed as a laundry list. So uh, you can see on the screen multiple gestation, assisted reproduction, short intrapartum interval, which is the space between births, intendedness of the pregnancy, some uh, health behaviors, health issues, um, poverty and race ethnicity because we have disparity both by income and by race ethnicity in the portion of babies born preterm. We think of often when we make those lists they look like just laundry lists of factors that are related to that that are seem to be associated with a high rate of preterm birth but actually these are factors that accumulate over people's lives. I, I like to think of it as there's kind of a time dimension and a space dimension to these population level risk factors. And the time dimension, my guess is you've seen this diagram before, most people in the maternal and child health field have. It's called the life course perspective. And it, it, it sets the idea that, um, you know, groups of women, Individual women are exposed to different risk factors or, or stressors, and they have different protective factors. And then as a group, uh, some women, because of their group characteristics, are exposed to more stressors or risk factors over time and have more or fewer protective factors. So we say, as a woman, as the life course unfolds, that shifts your risk. So that's kind of the time perspective. and then. We can also say what, what I call a space perspective, which is at the same time all of those uh, risk factors or group membership really is what they are, are uh, happen at various levels. So they intersect so that you have individual level factors, but also what's the family environment, what's the work environment, what's uh, the community environment, and you can take it all the way up to the policy environment. So the question that I posed um, for this presentation is if we, if we look and we're going to say assume life course and the kind of socio-ecological perspective of uh, different intersecting levels of risks, if we compare the U.S. to those other European countries, which population level exposures and protective risk factor, protective factors distinguish the U.S. from nations with lower preterm birth rates? You know, that will give us a sense of, so what, not necessarily what's driving the rate, but what's different about what's driving the rate in the U.S. compared to these other countries. And then, you know, take that a step further, which population level exposures and factors distinguish Alabama from the other states that have lower preterm birth rates? And are these the same? So do we stand out from the U.S. for the same reasons that the U.S. stands out um, from other countries? So that's the, uh, the questions that I'm going to answer with this presentation. And um, I don't have data on everything, as usual, that you would like to know, but I do have a um, considerable amount of data that I'm going to show you, comparative slides. And, and these are the population level risks that we're going to look at. At the individual level, some pregnancy characteristics. Is a woman carrying a single infant, a single fetus, or is she carrying multiple fetuses? Because uh, multiple fetuses are more likely to be born preterm. There are some age factors that are related to likelihood of preterm birth, some health behaviors, and then health status. So that's at the individual level. Then what I call the family level has to do with characteristics of a particular pregnancy. Uh, was the pregnancy intended or uh, would, did the women not want to become pregnant or wanted to become pregnant uh, later than she actually did? And then use of assisted reproduction technology. So this is like in vitro fertilization, uh, which does have a higher risk, I'll show you, of uh, 
ending up with a preterm birth. That's at the family level. At the community level, I want to talk about um, race and ethnicity, the m membership, and if, if you are of a certain ethnicity, that is associated with a higher likelihood of preterm birth. We can talk a little bit about why that is, why we think that is. Uh, and then poverty is also associated with preterm birth rates. So we're going to look at that. And then lastly, I want to draw your attention to the policy level. Um, this drives some of the other exposures that we're going to look at. So reproductive health policies can make a difference, and social welfare policies can make a difference in preterm birth rates, I'm going to suggest. Um, when you look at, at the policy level, that's interesting because it actually points you to uh, a place where there could be some interventions um, if, there's, if there's an interest. So starting uh, at the individual level with multiple gestations, uh, multiple gestation pregnancies are more likely to end preterm than singleton pregnancies. Um, one theory is that this is because when the uterus expands with a multiple gestation, uh, it can trigger the same mechanism that triggers normal labor, but triggers it early because the, um, the uterus is, is, gets larger earlier. That's one theory. Um, in terms of comparing the U.S. to European countries, we actually have a similar rate of twins, but a higher rate of triplets and higher order multiples in the U.S. compared to, this was a study that compared England, France, and Canada. And later we'll talk about why, why this might be. Um, I was very interested to look at Alabama versus the U.S., and it turns out that Alabama also has a higher rate of multiples uh, than the U.S. overall. This is, this is taken from the most recent uh, vital statistics data in Alabama and then comparing it to the U.S. So you can see uh, we have about 3.7 percent twins born in Alabama. We did in uh, 2015, and the U.S. had 3.3 percent. So what do we learn from this? I miss a statement, that uh, when we're comparing gestations, it is higher, multi more uh, multiple gestations in the U.S. and in Alabama compared to the comparison uh, areas uh, is one piece of the preterm birth story. Here's another uh, factor, maternal age. We focus a lot when, when we talk about, uh, matern about pregnancies on the risks of teen pregnancy. Uh, and you can see teen pregnancy is the bottom bar there, that uh, teens are more likely to have preterm babies than women uh, in their 20s or, yeah, in their 20, 20 to 24 or 25 to 29. But you can also see that the really larger risk for uh, preterm births is, that, is among women who are older. Uh, so above 35, higher risk, and then going all the way up in the 40s, uh, very high risk of preterm birth. Here's an international comparison. This is from the UN from 2012 about uh, the births per thousand by women's ages. And you can see the U.S. is at the bottom there. Uh, because of the alphabetical, uh, compared to other countries. And we actually have a much higher rate of births among younger women than uh, European countries. Uh, we have a, a lower rate of uh, age 35 to 39 compared to other countries. And then mm, somewhat lower rate in the 40s also. When you get to 45, we're all pretty low. So. The actual shift for the U.S. compared to other countries is it, towards the younger age. This is more recent data um, comparing Alabama and the U.S. Uh, you can see um, over time from 2008 to 2015, the U.S. births per thousand in the teens has gone down. It's still high. Um, Alabama is higher than the U.S. overall in uh, younger women having babies and lower uh, than the U.S. overall for women over 35 having 
babies. So we conclude, uh, generally, childbearing women are younger in the U.S. Uh, than in comparison countries. Childbearing women are younger in Alabama than in the U.S. Since the risk for preterm birth is really more for the older women, I don't think you can say that it's maternal age that drives higher preterm birth rates uh, as a risk. Moving to health behaviors. So we know that smoking while pregnant is a risk for low birth weight and preterm birth. Um, the CDC says this is because tobacco exposure reduces um, circulation, vasoconstriction, and that results in less oxygen going to the fetus, which can trigger low birth weight and also preterm birth. There's some evidence that heavy alcohol use may trigger preterm birth. It's definitely a threat to fetal development. Uh, th this is not, not everybody agrees with this finding, but it, it does seem, there is some data to suggest that early alcohol use may trigger preterm birth. Um, we're very interested in illicit drug exposure and its effect uh, during pregnancy, and it does have a negative effect, but not all drugs are associated with preterm birth. The only one that is, uh, has been when you, do, when you compare them is cocaine use for the same reason as tobacco use. So that being said, how does the U.S. compare to European countries in terms of maternal health behaviors? It turns out we're pretty good. Um, we have, you know, middle of the road tobacco exposure, middle of the road alcohol exposure, um, somewhat high cocaine use, but, but equivalent to what, to the use in the UK and also a little lower than the use in Spain based on the data that's available. So um, it doesn't look like at the national level you could say that women in the US have more preterm births because they have worse health behaviors. Alabama compared to the rest of the U.S., we actually do have um, a higher rate of adults who are current smokers. So if you, if you can extrapolate that to pregnant women, we probably have more pregnant women in our state exposed to tobacco than in the U.S. overall. Um, alcohol use were lower and cocaine use were lower. So um, we could conclude the U.S. does not have a higher rate of health behavior risks than the comparison countries Alabama does in terms of tobacco use. The last of the individual level risks that I want to talk about is maternal health status. Um, people talk a lot about the risk of obesity. Uh, Actually, obesity, women who are, um, have high BMI are not at higher risk for having a spontaneous preterm birth. They don't necessarily go into labor earlier, um, but they do tend to have more health complications, particularly hypertension, and that can lead to a greater likelihood of intervention. So obesity is a risk factor. Um, heart disease is, and hypertension are risk factors. Both for triggering preterm labor and also for triggering an intervention because of a health crisis. And then um, we have maternal mortality, which is death of a, of a woman within a year of having a delivery where the cause is, seems to be related to pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> and that's used as a measure of health complications. It's also increasingly used as a measure of quality of maternity care. So how do you think the U.S. stacks up to Europe uh, compared on, on the health status measures. Well, not so good. Um, we have a much higher uh, portion of our population that reports being obese, overweight and obese, than other countries. Um, we have a much higher rate of heart disease uh, and a much higher uh, incidence of maternal mortality than um, the European countries, much higher. So that really suggests uh, worse health status for U.S. women compared to uh, women in European countries. Alabama compared to the U.S., um, also a higher rate of obesity and a, and a considerably higher rate of deaths from heart disease. 
this is from our vital records uh, from 2015. As far as we can tell, and the maternal mortality um, data, the availability of that is, is difficult. It's, it, they're starting to organize it, but it's very hard to actually track. Um, the best data I could find was from 2003 to 2007, and, and comparatively, the Alabama was not higher than the rest of the U.S. on those measures. So um, certainly we can say both the U.S. compared to Europe and Alabama compared to the U.S. that, that, that the health status of women when they become pregnant uh, is a driver of higher preterm birth rates. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the family level risks, which we're here I want to talk about, um, you know, the pregnancy and how, how it occurred. Um, assisted reproduction, pregnancies that, that are related, that result from using assisted reproduction are more likely to end before term. Two reasons. One is because they're more often multiple births, which we know end before term. Uh, another reason is why are women using assisted reproduction? Often because they haven't been able to get pregnant. So they have uh, fecundity issues. So perhaps um, it's, it's challenges in, an, in implantation during the fetal development period. A lot of women um, who use assisted reproduction have had a series of miscarriages. And so the factors that drove that can drive early, early delivery for women with assisted re using assisted reproduction. That's data that shows um, likelihood of preterm birth. All pregnancies compared to pregnancies uh, from assisted reproduction, and you can see about almost 40 percent of uh, this is 2006 data. Almost 40 percent of births related to assisted reproduction end prematurely compared to, uh, at that time, about 13 uh, percent for all births. And you can see multiple, there's also more likely to be multiple births with ART. How the U.S. stacks up to Europe in terms of assisted reproduction, actually, uh, assisted reproduction is relatively, is more common in most European countries than it is in the U.S. You can see in Denmark, 10 percent of pregnancies are related to assisted reproduction. Um, United Kingdom, 2 percent, um, 2 percent. The U.S. is about 1.5 percent. So Italy is less than us, and we're similar to Germany and Portugal. And the other countries you see there have, have more pregnancies related to assisted reproduction. But what you also see on that slide is many more of our assisted reproduction pregnancies are multiple gestation. Um, in Europe, 2 percent, 1.8 percent. Uh, Denmark, I'm sorry, Denmark has 4.5 percent assisted reproduction, but 10 percent of those are multiple gestations. So uh, they and France have, have 10 percent twins. We've got 46 percent twins or higher. And we'll talk in the policy section about why that might be. So, but what it means, you can see, is that though we don't have more, the U.S. does not have more assisted reproduction pregnancies, we're going to have more preterm births because we're going to have more multiples. Alabama, the rate is about 0.7 of our pregnancies compared to 1.5 in the U.S. Uh, and this is 2015 data. Um, so we have about half as many assisted reproduction pregnancies as the U.S. as a whole, and slightly more of our assisted reproduction pregnancies are multiples compared to uh, the U.S. overall. So the U.S., yes, um, although we don't have as many assisted reproduction pregnancies, we have more multiples, so that drives the rates. Um, Alabama, we have fewer, but we have slightly more multiples. So we have to say that the choices people make during assisted reproduction could contribute to the higher preterm birth rates. Okay, another risk factor that, that gets a lot of attention with preterm births is uh, un whether a pregnancy is, in, is intended. Um, and we have people here in the room that work on the PRAMS survey for Alabama which is the source of a lot of information on whether a woman who had a delivery had intended to become pregnant. I, th I think it's a major um, source of data on that. Um, 
there's a lot of reasons for unintended pregnancies uh, being preterm, uh, kind of complex reasons. One is that um, women who had a baby and then immediately get pregnant again, that's often related to uh, a preterm birth. The, the theory is that it's difficult for a pregnant woman to fully recover. And then she gets pregnant again, she um, has health challenges that are related to preterm delivery. Um, other theories that, that women whose pregnancies are unintended um, experience stress during their pregnancy because they didn't mean to become pregnant, didn't have it planned, uh, have difficult family circumstances, perhaps don't have social support. And stress is definitely a risk factor for preterm births. Um, if you actually try to look at this in a more complex way, um, it looks, it looked to me anyway, that um, if you have women who are at risk for other, f other reasons, and then on top of that their pregnancies are unintended, um, that drives a risk up. So a woman who's low risk otherwise and got pregnant without meaning to is not at the same risk as somebody very stressed who uh, faces a lot of risk factors and then becomes pregnant. So if we wanted to look at, you know, you, we could ask this question, does the U.S. have a higher portion of births that are unintended uh, than other parts of the world? This is um, taken from U.N. data, and, and in the U.N. system, they go by uh, continents. So we have Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and North America, which combines the U.S. and Canada. And you can see a couple of things on this slide. Estimates of what portion of all pregnancies are unintended, and then what portion of those unintended pregnancies actually go on to uh, become live births versus ending in a miscarriage or an abortion. And what you can see here is that the U.S. has a higher portion of unintended pregnancies than most other European countries. The, the exception is Eastern European countries. We have a, a higher portion than any of the parts of Europe, that's us and Canada combined, um, of unintended pregnancies that go on to be live births. And partly, you can see we actually have about in the middle range of abortions, the other part of Europe that has as high a portion of unintended pregnancies as we do is Eastern Europe, but they have a much higher abortion rate. Consequently, they have a much lower portion of unintended pregnancies that end in live births. So you would have to say in the U.S. compared to Europe, unintend, higher rates of unintended, of births from unintended pregnancies is a driver of our higher preterm birth rates. How this compares to Alabama, <clears throat> actually the portion of pregnancies that are unintended, um, the estimates are about the same in Alabama compared to the U.S. I know we think a lot in Alabama that we've got this really high portion of unintended pregnancies, um, and 55 percent is high, but it's not higher than the rest of the U.S. But if you look, we have many more of those unintended pregnancies that go on to end uh, in a birth, and that's because we have a much lower portion that where the women un unintentionally pregnant get an abortion. The implication of this, I just want to say right now, is uh, if we assume that abortion rates are not going to go up in Alabama, in order to reduce this risk factor in comparison to the rest of the U.S., we would actually have to have a much uh, lower rate than the rest of the U.S. of pregnancies that start unintended. In other words, we would need to have much better use of contraception if we weren't going to uh, increase access to abortion if we wanted to lower that risk factor. So unintended pregnancies, uh, both in the U.S., both because less pregnancy planning and because of lower abortion rates, and in Alabama, because of lower abortion rates, we have more unintended pregnancies going on to be live births. Okay, I'm going to move now to what we could call the community-level risk factors, um, and this is uh, race, ethnicity, and poverty, as, as you'll remember um, from the beginning of, of this presentation. 
We know that women who are racial or ethnic minorities in their countries have higher preterm birth rates. A lot of us assume that, that race and ethnicity are related to genetics, but it looks like, and I'm going to show you data on this in a minute, um, it does not look like these racial and ethnic differences are driven by biological population factors. Uh, black women who were born outside the U.S. are less likely to have a preterm birth than black women who grew up in the U.S. There's an interaction between being a minority in a majority country and uh, having a preterm birth. If you look at um, rates of preterm birth among Hispanic women, there is something called uh, the Latina paradox, which is that if you look overall at women of Hispanic uh, ancestry giving birth in the U.S., they actually have outcomes that are similar or better to uh, non-Hispanic women, if you exclude the black population. But if you focus on women, um, say, of Mexican heritage, the longer a Mexican heritage woman lives in the U.S., the worse her pregnancy outcome likelihood is. So the longer women live as minorities in majority non-Hispanic uh, culture, the um, greater their likelihood of having a, a preterm birth. So I wondered, well, is this similar in uh, Europe compared to uh, is, is the risk factor similar? Uh, and in fact, it is. Um, where you can tell, and it, this is a little trickier because they don't collect data on race, ethnicity in Europe to the extent that we do in the U.S. But if you can um, tease it out, immigrant women of non-European origin have higher preterm birth rates than native-born women in Europe. Uh, in Canada, Native American women have higher preterm birth rates than Canadians of European ancestry. Uh, and this is the data on um, black women of different ancestry. This was a really interesting study that used um, birth certificates from New York City from 1998 to 2002, so hundreds of thousands of birth certificates. They um, parceled out the birth certificates uh, for women who reported their race as black. And then they tracked where were these women born. And um, you can see US-born black women are there on the left side of your screen. So they're set at one because this is relative risks. And then you can see that almost every uh, ancestry, <coughs> with the exception of Cuban black women, have a lower rate of preterm birth than U.S.-born black women. So there's something about being black in the U.S. growing up here that is related to preterm birth. And then at the far end, you can see the comparison of uh, U.S. white women, a much lower rate of preterm birth than U.S.-born black women. So the, the implication here, I think, from this study, it, it's not the genetics of being of sub-Saharan African heritage that is associated with preterm birth. It's something about being a minority in a majority country, because you see it in Europe, too. Um, it, it implies that the experience of being a minority, the racism and other kinds of negative exposures that women have are related to stress. Stress is related to preterm birth is, say, the working theory there. So how does the U.S. compare to uh, European countries in terms of the portion of the population that's uh, not European white ancestry? Obviously, we have a much higher portion of our population. This is taking population as a whole, um, residents of the different countries. Um, just over 35 percent of the U.S. population in the 2010 census uh, was not non-Hispanic white. In European countries, uh, the highest were Spain and Italy, and that's just a little over 5 percent. And the rest of those countries are much lower. So, so just from a starting basis, if being a minority in a majority country creates a risk factor for preterm birth, we're going to have more of that.
um, in the U.S. And I am going to show you Alabama data, but I wanted to show you something else first, which is this question of poverty. Women living in poverty are more likely to have preterm births than women who don't live in poverty. And this is observed in European countries, in the U.S., um, all over the globe, really, that the worst preterm birth rates come in the uh, lowest resourced populations. Uh, it's not easy to get data about this because our birth certificate system where we get a lot of data uh, looking at, at pregnancy outcomes doesn't collect income and doesn't really report education either as, as a factor um, so that it's difficult to make those comparisons. Uh, this data actually compares uh, PRAMS survey data to a similar uh, survey that's done in Canada and, and breaking uh, income into the highest, middle, and the lowest. And you can see in the U.S., um, lowest portion of preterm births among the highest income women, highest in the lowest. And Canada tracks sim similarly, although the rates are lower, but you still find that income gradient. And by the way, I, I didn't put a slide in on this, but sometimes people confuse um, race and income as risk factors and say, well, uh, maybe the rate among black women is higher because more black women are poor. But if you have the data to, to parcel that out and look at both income and race, those are two separate risk factors. Poor women are more likely to have preterm births. Minority women are more likely to have preterm births, and those are separate risk factors. So how does the U.S. stack up to European countries in terms of poverty rates? Um, this is very interesting. And the, the first column here shows you um, rates, the portion of the population that is below the median of income in, in the different countries. And you can see the U.S. is 27.8 percent. The United Kingdom is 30 percent. Um, Spain is 38 percent. So we actually have you know, middle to the low range of portion of the population in poverty compared to European countries. But on the right hand, to the right of that is, the, is that if you take out, if you adjust for welfare payments and income transfers and taxes, we actually um, have a higher portion of our population exposed to poverty. And the, the middle column there is uh, total population, and then the far right column is uh, the population of children, which I, is kind of a proxy for um, households likely to have children, uh, is why I put that in there. And we're um, generally, so what that means is, although we have not the highest poverty rates, we have less social welfare benefits. And that means that our, the U.S. population, a larger portion of, of our population is exposed to the stresses of poverty compared to European countries. To look, I wanted to look at these issues, both minority and um, poverty, and the social welfare transfers um, in Alabama compared to the rest of the states. And I thought an interesting way to do that would be to compare the three states that got Fs on the March of Dimes report card to the four states that got As. And let's just see what, what they look like. So in the first column, what you see is the, the portion, the, the states with Fs have a much higher portion of non-Hispanic whites in the population. Um, Vermont and New Hampshire, you have at 5 and 6 percent. Washington has 22 percent, Mississippi has 40 percent, and Louisiana and Alabama are also in the 30 percent. So consistently, if, if you looked at that map, the report card map, you could almost put it against a map of portion minority and you'd get similar states. The women in Alabama, more of them are going to be exposed to the stresses of being a minority than in these other states. Um, if you look at poverty level, also, the three F states have higher poverty rates, for the most part, than the four A states. 
well, we, we definitely have higher poverty rates. Um, and then if you look at the portion of families in poverty who receive welfare benefits, um, much higher in those A states than in the F states. The F states, um, because, you know, setting the threshold for, for receiving welfare is a state-by-state -state process, and the states um, that have an F happen to be states that have set that threshold very low so that not only are more people in poverty, but fewer of them get social welfare benefits compared to um, the, the A states, if we can call them that. So um, what do we conclude from this? The population of the U.S. includes more racial and ethnic minorities than the population of comparison countries. Taking income transfers into account, a larger portion of the U.S. population is, is in poverty, exposed to poverty. And states with an F grade and the March of Dimes report card also have more minorities and more adults uh, in poverty and fewer adults with uh, fewer of those people in poverty receiving social welfare benefits than uh, in the A states based on the report card. So you see both um, in both the U.S. and Europe and then in Alabama compared to the U.S., more minorities in the population, um, more poverty, and fewer welfare benefits. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about um, the policy level. So this is kind of our outer ring in uh, in the space diagram of, of what, how, what factors affect population level risks. And um, some of the risks that we've looked at here, the family level risks uh, of assisted reproduction and uh, unintendedness, are affected by reproductive health policy. In terms of assisted reproduction, m many European countries and also Canada actually finance uh, assisted reproduction. That means if you want fertility treatments, you can get them through your health service or your national health insurance will cover them. Now, probably partly because the government is financing assisted reproduction, the government sets rules saying uh, what they will cover. And for the most, many in many countries uh, that finance, they say, um, if you're going to have in vitro fertilization, you can only implant one embryo. Um, that results in a singleton pregnancy. Also, restrictions on the health status of women who, who would be able to get financing uh, for fertility treatments, uh, standards on how this would be done at, at the clinics, what, what kind of techniques clinics um, could use. The U.S. in general does not have a financing policy. I, I think there may be some insurance companies that cover that, but often, very often, women who get uh, use in vitro fertilization and assisted reproduction in the U.S. Uh, pay out of pocket. That means that um, we do not have general rules for you must have single implant pregnancies, and um, many clinics actually advise uh, women to get multiple implants when they have in vitro fertilization. Families like it. Clinics like it. Um, it's not advised, actually, from a health point of view. The ethical standards for assisted reproduction say singleton pregnancies are better. Um, multiple pregnancies increase the success rate, and people who are paying out of pocket like to have better success rates, clinics like to have better success rates, and that explains probably why we have so many more um, of our assisted reproduction pregnancies that are multiples. In terms of unintended births, um, rates of contraceptive use are higher in European countries compared to the U.S. Um, the estimates are about 80 percent uh, of women in European countries use contraception. The estimates in the U.S. are about 65 percent. And that's for a complex of reasons, cultural, 
reasons also financing, uh, reasons availability. Um, we know there's controversies about coverage of contraception by insurance in the U.S. Abortion rates are about the same in the U.S. compared to European countries. Uh, more contraceptive use lowers the portion of unintended births. Uh, Contraceptive use in Alabama is about the same, it looks like, as the U.S. as a whole, but abortion rates are lower. And, and availability of abortion is definitely affected by reproductive health policies in, in terms of uh, financing, in terms of the locale, where you can go, how available it is, various restrictions uh, on abortion. So that's definitely reproductive health policy. Um, where there is more availability of abortion, it lowers the portion of, preg of unintended pregnancies that go to births, which would lower the preterm birth rate. So that's reproductive health policies. And then social welfare policies also matter. <clears throat> As we saw in the data earlier, European countries have a similar portion of adults in poverty as the U.S., but a larger portion receiving government support. And also that's true at the state level. And what does social welfare does? It actually um, intervenes, it modifies the effect of poverty on people. So you still have the stress of being in poverty, but if you have some source of welfare benefit, it reduces that level of material stress. Okay, I wanted to just give you a summary of, of all these risk factors, because I know we kind of went through them as a laundry list. And here I'm, I'm just showing you what pops out for the U.S. compared to Europe in terms of risks and what pops out for Alabama compared to the U.S. Um, multiple gestation, more multiple gestation is a risk for both the U.S. and for Alabama. Smoking is a risk for Alabama in comparisons, not for the U.S. as a whole. Uh, and both the U.S as a whole compared to Europe and Alabama compared to the U.S. have issues with uh, worse um, maternal health status, particularly obesity and heart disease. At the family level, the portion of pregnancies having assisted reproduction is not higher, but the portion of uh, ART that results in multiple births is higher, both in the U.S. compared to Europe and in Alabama. Uh, Unintended pregnancies are higher in the U.S. Unintended pregnancies ending in birth are higher in both the U.S. and Alabama. At the community level, the U.S. and Alabama both have larger minority populations exposed to the stresses that that uh, causes and a larger portion net living in poverty. And at the policy level, both um, Policies that would support intentional childbirth and policies that would support singleton ART pregnancies uh, are, are lacking in the U.S. compared to Europe and in Alabama compared to the U.S. In Alabama and the U.S. both have weaker social welfare policies. So the net conclusion, let's just say there are many factors that combine to put the U.S. at the bottom of the rankings for preterm birth rates and put Alabama at the bottom of national rankings. And um, you can tell I'm, I'm not at all a fan of calling this a report card because it just implies that if you just tried harder, um, you would do better. And, and if you look at the circumstances, that isn't the case. So I think we need to back off a little bit on that idea of, of uh, interventions. but. Uh, but I will say that if, because we always do, being in public health, like to talk about interventions, what would really matter? Improving the health status, reducing obesity, and reducing tobacco use in, in Alabama uh, would actually, should actually help lower the preterm birth rate. And then policies that would modify the impact of poverty on the large portion of our population that experiences poverty could make a difference. So I hope you found that interesting, that kind of comparison, and I'm really happy to answer any questions, if there are. I'll leave us on that conclusion slide. Currently at this time, we don't have any questions okay. via email or over the phone. Any questions in the audience? Are you depressed or happy? <laughs> what do you think? 
I think it's a major issue here in the state of Alabama, as we know, that preterm births um, are the leading cause. Two-thirds of our infant mortality is related to preterm births, so um, there's lots of work to be done. Mm -hmm. So, But we want to thank you, Dr. Ronstein, for coming and, and providing this presentation today. And um, if there are any questions after, please let us know and we'll get back to sure, you. Sure, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you.